Witamy Państwa bardzo serdecznie, Wojciech Fudala. I Justyna Boduch. Dzień dobry. Dziękujemy bardzo, dziękujemy bardzo za obecność na kolejnym wykładzie z cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury. Mistrzowie Architektury to cykl wykładów, który odbywa się przez, są zorganizowane przez Stowarzyszenie Architektów Polskich w Katowicach. Jest to cykl, który polega na przedstawianiu mistrzów architektury z całego świata. Myślę, że większość osób zna, przychodzi i śledzi nasze wydarzenia. Natomiast chcielibyśmy również zaprosić na scenę Ewę Szymańską-Sułkowską ze Stowarzyszenia Architektów Polskich w Katowicach, która opowie nam więcej o stowarzyszeniu, które organizuje mistrzów. Zapraszamy. Dzień dobry. Bardzo mi miło Państwa powitać w imieniu prezesa oddziału i całego zarządu oddziału Stowarzyszenia Architektów Polskich w Katowicach. Bardzo się cieszę widząc Państwa tutaj, bo wiemy, że seria naszych wykładów cieszy się niesłabnącą popularnością. Jak wspomniała koleżanka Justyna, te, ta seria wykładów odbywa się już od bardzo dawna. Od blisko 20 lat realizujemy spotkania z wybitnymi postaciami świata architektury, czego zwieńczeniem jest nasza wspaniała książka, która została świeżo co wydana, także zapraszamy do zapoznawania się z tą piękną publikacją, którą można nabyć albo w dniu dzisiejszym, albo także w siedzibie naszego stowarzyszenia na ulicy Dyrekcyjnej 9. Serdecznie zapraszamy. Ale nie samymi mistrzami stowarzyszenie żyje. Jest to oczywiście nasz chyba największy, największe wydarzenie o największym rozmachu światowym, można rzec. Ale organizujemy także konkursy na najlepszą przestrzeń województwa śląskiego, na Architekturę Roku, na Dyplomy Roku. Jest tutaj z nami duża, spora część młodzieży. Myślę, że część z Was może jeszcze studiuje, może jesteście absolwentami. Zapraszamy także do udziału w tych konkursach. No oczywiście flagową działalnością stowarzyszenia jest czuwanie nad organizowaniem i przebiegiem konkursów architektonicznych, w ramach których wyłaniane są wspaniałe obiekty właściwie w całej Polsce. Najbliższym wydarzeniem, takim branżowym można rzec, jest nasze spotkanie, coroczne spotkanie na majówce architektów w Domu Pracy Twórczej Architekta w Ustroniu. Serdecznie Państwa zapraszamy. Zapraszamy wszystkie osoby, które chciałyby się włączyć także w działalność stowarzyszenia. Osoby, które chcą poświęcić swój czas, swoją energię, swoją kreatywność. Chętnie omówimy wasze pomysły i nasze możliwości na takim spotkaniu. Także w ostatni weekend maja, 27 maja zapraszamy do Domu Pracy Twórczej Architekta w Ustroniu. Zachęcam do śledzenia wszystkich naszych wydarzeń na stronach internetowych, na naszych stronach mediów społecznościowych i o tym już opowie szerzej Justyna. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękujemy Ewa. Jeśli chodzi o media społecznościowe, zachęcamy do śledzenia Instagrama, Facebooka oraz Twittera. Na samym początku, kiedy rozpoczęliśmy Mistrzów, działaliśmy skromnie. Natomiast później stwierdziliśmy, że należy się rozwijać. Media społecznościowe otwierane są oknem na świat. Pozwalają nam dotrzeć do większej grupy odbiorców, do ludzi, studentów oraz architektów z całego świata. Taka mała anegdotka właśnie poprzez Instagram. Zaprosiliśmy Etana Kimela z Izraela, który właściwie śledząc nasze media i Instagram sam się do nas odezwał i zapytał, czym są mistrzowie architektury, czym jest Stowarzyszenie Architektów Polskich, czym się zajmujemy i czy mógłby zrobić wystawę w Katowicach oraz wystąpić. Dlatego też zachęcamy do śledzenia Instagrama i do poszerzania swojej, swojej wiedzy, ponieważ jest to również platforma edukacyjna, gdzie opisujemy prace twórcze, obiekty, które powstają naszych mistrzów. Podobnie z Facebookiem, gdzie 
zaczęliśmy go rozwijać również w momencie pandemicznym. Wówczas mieliśmy ograniczony dostęp do, do spotkań na żywo, do wykładów na żywo, do relacji międzyludzkich. Natomiast dzięki właśnie mediom mogliśmy się otworzyć, mogliśmy to kontynuować i nie musieliśmy kończyć tej współpracy. E, tak jest. E, nasz dzisiejszy wykład będzie podzielony na dwie części z przerwą kawową w połowie. E, tak jak widzieliście przy wejściu tutaj obok jest wystawiona lada cateringowa, więc w połowie wykładu, w połowie wykładu e, zapraszamy was też na taką integracyjną przerwę i na poczęstowanie się e, kawą. E, zachęcamy również też podczas przerwy do odwiedzenia stoisk naszych partnerów. E, dzisiejszymi naszymi partnerami jest sześć firm, czyli firma Sto, firma Rechał, firma Cuntobel, Fakro oraz Furnico i Archikat. Także dziękujemy bardzo za, za, za wsparcie. Archikat oczywiście reprezentowany przez WSC, który jest głównym dystrybutorem Archikada w Polsce. Także poza kawą zachęcamy też, żebyście w przerwie odwiedzili ich stoiska, wzięli jakieś materiały, katalogi, bo warto. W międzyczasie chciałam jeszcze powiedzieć dwa słowa o naszym konkursie, który odbędzie się właśnie na platformie Instagram pod postem, gdzie wrzucimy zdjęcia nasze, książki naszego mistrza. Zachęcamy Państwa do składania pytań do mistrza wówczas Mistrz wybierze najlepsze pytania i wyłonimy zwycięzcę nagrody. Tak jest, to jeszcze dodam jedną rzecz, bo e, poza tymi dwoma książkami autorstwa UN Studio, które dzisiaj będą do wygrania, e, możecie też wygrać dodatkowe gadżety e, UN Studio, czyli e, makietę wydrukowaną w 3D, makietę ich budynku FOR we Frankfurcie, o którym też na pewno dzisiaj nasz gość wspomni i dodatkowo specjalny notatnik UN Studio, więc myślę, że chwilę po rozpoczęciu wykładu pojawi się post na Instagramie, pod którym możecie zadawać pytania do mistrza. My w przerwie wykładu, w przerwie wykładu wybierzemy najciekawsze pytania i na tej podstawie, znaczy mistrz wybierze najciekawsze pytania, więc prosimy w miarę możliwości o zadawanie tych pytań aż do pierw, końca pierwszej części wykładu. W przerwie wykładu nasz mistrz wybierze najciekawsze i najciekawsze autorzy tych pytań zostaną nagrodzeni tymi książkami. Dodatkowo e, będziecie też mieli okazję wygrać e, książki o cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury. To są książki, które wydaliśmy z początkiem tego roku, więc e, również osoby, które zadadzą najciekawsze pytania, e, takie trzy książki dzisiaj dla Was przygotowaliśmy, które możecie wygrać. Niezależnie od tego, przed wejściem do sali wykładowej znajduje się stoisko e, i przy tym stoisku również będziecie mogli te książki zakupić, jeśli oczywiście nie uda Wam się ich e, wygrać. I cena takiej książki to jest 80 zł, płatność jest albo gotówką, albo jest też możliwość blikiem. A teraz myślę, że już pora przejść do głównej części naszego dzisiejszego spotkania, więc przejdę na język angielski. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for coming here today. I would like to introduce our special guest. We have a pleasure of hosting an extremely interesting person, because he comes from Greece, he's born in Greece, uh, but he represents a Dutch studio. Uh, so very interesting studio because uh, they do very futuristic uh, projects. Uh, for example, they work using robots, uh, they work using 3D printings, uh, they even did uh, a book which is a lamp at the same time, so there are a lot of interesting uh, things. Uh, so. Please welcome and give a big amount of applause to our guest from you and studio, Konstantinos Chrysos. Thank you very much. First of all, we do architecture, but we like to have fun and uh, do other things as well. Um, I need a clicker. So I would introduce today a little bit the way we think in UN Studio, not so much of one project, but a series of thoughts on how we operate. UN Studio, as you might um, know, it uh, means United Network Studio. We believe in the power of having uh, knowledge sharing and connecting internally and externally with uh, different 
collaborators, with clients, but also um, having this opportunity now that uh, Wojciech has invited us here um, on behalf of UN Studio, of course, and um, having one more node in the network of UN Studio here in Katowice. And of course, this would have been possible without my colleague uh, Jerzy, who is also with me here today. He was, let's say, the tangent connecting UN Studio to Katowice for tonight. For UN Studio, we really believe in uh, the power of uh, design informing and helping the design that uh, we have as people, as inhabitants, as visitors. Um, but this goes without saying that we need to always respect the planet, controlling the footprint of our interventions, and all be, always be informed. This we manage, as mentioned, throughout a network, disseminating and learning and um, sharing knowledge. We work around the globe, as you will see. This is a knowledge that we bring. We are involved in research, as you heard also earlier. All this knowledge is something that we like to cultivate and promote through our design. Starting from small interventions within uh, Amsterdam and the cultural, let's say, center, uh, all the way to making cities with, within cities. This is the project of Frankfurt, Frankfurt 4. It's a project that I've been working since 2016. I could have made the lecture just for this, but um, for now, I will give you more of an image of what else UN Studio is about. Creating cultural icons with the Mercedes-Benz Museum, but also thinking of how the future of mobility can uh, transform. Always being sustainability conscious, and thriving to improve our buildings with state-of-the-art technology in uh, creating, for example, the ECHO uh, the building that we will see also later, becoming an uh, energy positive, but also rethinking uh, how a, a neighborhood be, can be upgraded, can be, become smarter with the introduction of technology. But all this is to create meaningful places, not just to create futuristic images or interesting design, but it's something that will have a lasting impact to our lives. This is a sailor who, every time he arrives <clears throat> at the port of Rotterdam, he sees the Erasmus Bridge and he knows he's home. As I mentioned, UN Studio is a network, not only externally, but also internally. We have our urban, our architectural, our product, and our interior groups, which are the core design teams, but we have also a speculative and an experienced design team uh, that informs our design and helps us um, think before architecture and after architecture how this can evolve. Um, the office was founded in 1988 in Amsterdam from Ben van Berkel and Carolyn Boss, uh, the two founders and thought leaders for our office, where also, let's say, the mothership of our office is situated with um, 200 architects. Now we're more to close to 300 at the moment including uh, all of the team. And through the years, uh, we have expanded in uh, different areas of the world, given opportunities of projects that we will see. We have Shanghai, uh, a big office of 50 people, and um, also in Hong Kong, a sister office, and then Frankfurt, Dubai, Melbourne. They were uh, starting the past few years uh, to support local projects that started. And the most recent addition was the venture to the United States and opening in Austin, Texas for a starting of a big project there. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a global experience that we try to harvest and bring with us. We can see here a little bit of a variety of locations that we've um, done projects with. I had the pleasure to have projects of mine in five different continents, not all realized, of course, but having traveled and getting that experience and facing throughout all these different scales is something very important. It's something that also in the core of our thinking, uh, and, and as we see here from our founder, is like, how can we future-proof the, the, our future? How can we use our design to learn and uh, promote um, the qualities of uh, a healthy, adaptive uh, architecture that it's also um, centered on, on our well-being? I will introduce a few ideas that we have been um, uh, exploring and how they evolved throughout the different uh, periods and uh, through different years, how we learn from every different step 
and uh, going to the next uh, level. Erasmus Bridge was the founding project of our office. It was a very nice uh, opportunity that, we, that our founder, 30 years ago, was introduced to bring an icon to a city. It, it, the brief was purely to connect two sides of a city, uh, two sides of the river between Rotterdam. This, though, triggered um, an investigation. How can the, the tools of the time be used in order to become um, a pioneering, let's say, medium to help you realize uh, a, a bigger, um, let's say, brief, a bigger requirement, that something beyond the bridge. And all this, from a small office, they managed to fabricate and put into place. And in the end, it created an, uh, a landmark. It was not just then a functional infrastructural bridge, but it became the symbol of the city, which triggered not only, let's say, the connectivity, but triggered the south side reinventing the economy uh, of uh, Rotterdam and being part of this bigger boom of uh, the Netherlands in the 90s. So just an infrastructural project becomes a landmark and a generator for something more. This is kind of creating a new place making that everybody now can relate and want to kind of connect to when being in that uh, location. A similar story we can find also in the Mercedes-Benz Museum. This was a competition for a car showroom to showcase what Mercedes-Benz uh, was about. It evolved to the, the story and the history of mobility, of course, through Mercedes-Benz, but capturing architecturally the notion of time and how this could be transformed also in the experience that the inhabitant, the visitor, will have. And of course, making this possible also, again, with innovation and design tools and creating an efficient and buildable project. This was something that the project manager at the time were saying we will not be able to open by 2006. The World Cup was happening that summer, and uh, it will be out of budget. With the tools that were available at the time and systematization and modularity, it was opened on time. But why is this an important reference uh, to the topic? Because it started as a, a car showroom, it evolved to a museum for Mercedes-Benz, it became a cultural hub for the area, which then invigorated the, the surrounding neighborhood and attracting more social functions around it. So a simple architectural brief was upgraded through architecture. In a similar way, we are also kind of thinking in, towards the future. How can we upgrade this, the core of our cities, our neighborhood? How can we make them into the smartest neighborhood uh, of Europe, as it was the challenge that we were given from the Brainport Smart District group, which is a group of uh, the municipality of Helmond and also in the universities are around there, so it's a publicly, let's say, funded in investigation of how can we upgrade our um, urban living. 
how can we create a master plan that goes beyond a top-down approach where we predefine as designers, which we always enjoy, how this should happen, but create a collaborative, almost open lab, living lab, um, master plan that will create from the inhabitants and the users upwards. It's going to be a responsive, highly flexible, new way of working that we will uh, introduce here, simply because we want to make it a uh, self-learning environment. You see your beliefs in uh, the way how today with new technology that you can uh, improve um, interactiveness between uh, the different uh, user groups in a uh, location. I mean, all these ideas uh, we uh, believe are going to uh, generate much better uh, communication and liveliness in the community than a single mono-functional housing project. It's going to be a cross-section of uh, everyone you can imagine in a society. So from the uh, 1500 houses we uh, are going to uh, bring over in that uh, project, we will have the 300 uh, social housing. Everything is connected to an um, urban data platform, I think that that is the most interesting. And that we will make sure that data is protected, that people will not have to be worried about that they give data away uh, through ethic boards. We will then protect um, these data for the people who are using it. You will not have a linear call it design strategy whereby you design, decide and then come up with uh, a housing project whereby then everyone can follow exactly what the architect uh, invented there. And it's invented by everyone. So having in mind that this is an experiment, a living lab, an urban scale living lab where um, people are going to be invited to live there and share their experience and see how um, a new more collaborative and more uh, circular and sustainable way of living could be possible. Not exactly as it will happen, but how can we learn? There are new tools happening. We see what's happening with artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of concern, but you always need to test it in a control environment to be able to learn and move forward. In this case, we still analyze the city, uh, um, the bigger master plan. This is one slice of the bigger master plan that we saw before that is given now to our team to develop further. And you look at the cross-section and how you can hybridize traditional ways and ingredients of a city, but always being inclusive, circular, and thinking of a sustainable and energy-positive way of putting together. So all these th things would be kind of combined... Oops, sorry, wrong direction. will be combined and hybridized. How can someone be living and also at the same time being f uh, farming and create produce for your neighbor who then would give you back part of his energy that he produced? And, and all this is made possible, as we said, in this kind of testing control environment through an infra uh, infrastructure layer of, uh, of data. How can then our usage and our knowledge become a commodity that you can exchange. How can you know a little bit and become more interconnected uh, as a society through uh, four pillars of health, mobility, food and energy? This is explored further and in, in, in its a very important way of learning by doing. How can we create a meaningful place uh, if we don't learn uh, the new uh, tools that are available. Moving now to an another thing that it has been very important for our studio is crafting. How can we use um, the tools that we saw also before uh, to create uh, spaces that are socially responsible and are exactly as it's here, like human-centric. We started the, uh, with our project um, about uh, 15 years ago, which was the reason that we opened in Shanghai the office, the Twin Raffle, Raffles Towers, which is a mixed-use program uh, of offices, of hotel, and uh, apartment buildings, which are, let's say, uh, catered from the hotel entity, and then a vibrant social podium with commercial functions. 
what is, uh, and here we see kind of the multifunctionality, the complexity, and how our design tools at the time helped us now focusing more on the example of the facade, how to control and through a generative process create um, the 3D model initially, but the most important part is to cre actually that we created a drawing document and optimization for the construction. The contractors at the time were giving up. They could not manage the complexity, but with a responsibility of being innovative in your design, you have to be also responsible in executing it. And these our tools allowed us to transform the concept also to reality and the adaptive and performative facade to become part of the execution in an efficient and buildable way. In the same way, moving away from the generative design, we come to for Frankfurt. Um, this is in downtown Frankfurt, four towers. Uh, two of them, yeah, here we see uh, it's in the historic and the, and the economic district. And the whole um, challenge and the goal there was to kind of combine the two worlds, to bring a livable city, a city for all, as we call. It has two towers, which are uh, of uh, office main program, number one and number four. Um, and number one will have the tallest inhabited floor. It's not the tallest tower uh, still in relation to the antenna of the Commerzbank. And then two residential towers that we see here in the forefront of the image, which will have condominium, but also rental apartments. It will have um, a hotel program of uh, timeshare and, uh, and also uh, affordable housing on the lower part and also in the plinth. And the podium uh, that we have is still uh, uh, open to the public park deck that people would be able to visit, not everywhere, but a big part that overlooks at the square in front. And all this complexity, we managed to deal with it with modularity. How can we go before, beyond the generative design and think of design as uh, data? Modularity would allow us flexibility, which means sustainability can change our function in an easy way. You can plan <clears throat> and develop uh, as if it's a kit of parts. And for example, here in the office floor plan, the grid that we see around corresponds also to what will come on the floor from an electrical engineer, will come in the ceiling from a mechanical engineer, and all this allowed for a more adaptable a floor plate that also in, in regards to structure, it had prefabricated concrete slabs that made the whole building process uh, much more clean and efficient. This also, of course, uh, corresponded to the facade where you have a more complex image, but then uh, based on data, you, we were able to create this kind of genotypes and th through this communicated to the facade construction companies and allow them to fabricate efficiently and also build the towers with the tall tower being a week and a half per floor and a, every week a floor uh, for the smaller tower. So this is going beyond just building a building, but building the data that would allow you to check and foresee and forecast what will come uh, in the project. And all of this is a bit of uh, where we are standing today because in development, um, this is the shortest one where we can see the full height and the facade is there. And we're here at 150 meters at the tallest one. This one is in complete height and number two is now growing up. And to manage this complexity, it would have been only possible through having built the project through data already before. But all of this, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's a city for all. It's creating a social hub, not just another building where it combines the ingredients of the city within one quarter. Now in a different type of project, how going even further than just uh, data, how can we use uh, our, uh, technology even further in designing more human-centrically? This is the project in uh, Korea that we won. Uh, it's from the National Federation where they wanted a training uh, a camp for them, but it was a master plan to go beyond just a training camp that would introduce also... Um, this shouldn't happen. 
sorry, introduce also functions of uh, training, of course, but also hotel for visitors uh, and uh, also a museum and make it in the public. What is important in the video that is running behind is this happened during COVID and we used immersive technologies to be able to communicate with our clients and our consultants who were in the States, who were in Korea, and how we can have a more immersive understanding of the architecture, seeing it in different times of day, different light conditions, and be able to wander through the space, but at the same time be able to share uh, sections and details and drawings and sketch on them at real time. And again, this is an experiment to see how can we use uh, new tools to help us become more efficient and closer to what these needs are. Uh, also, for example, here, also allowing us to parametrically control and alter things at, at live uh, during our meetings through that same platform. And something that is very new, um, oops, uh, this is an advertisement for our latest, one of our latest projects. What, it, what does it do? As it says in the title, is cognitive design process. We reach out to uh, people who would have these gadgets and experience, in this particular case, the public transport uh, system of a city, and then we gather the data, which we use then to inform our design. Here we are requested to guide the city to reintroduce and reinvent its public transport system and of course where to start before of the, uh, the users themselves and how they experience and how they find a quality uh, in what is there. And through these uh, spectacles you can see where the eye stops, through the watch you can see uh, the reaction, are you stressed, are you happy, are you enjoying it, and then this will inform also our design process. Another um, topic is mobility, but actually mobility is not the art of moving, but it's also density, because if you can move through spaces very fast, they become closer to each other. Something that um, I was really amazed of the metropolitan uh, network that is around um, Katowice and the great potential that this could bring uh, uh, as a connecti connecting all together. Uh, in our case, we started in the 90s uh, with the Arnhem Central Station. That's the title, but the reality, it was a master plan. It was a master plan and, a, and an actual a mobility node. How to connect different modes of transportation and how to make an economic model that this would work. From the two office towers that generated revenue to produce uh, the rest of the infrastructure of the master plan. The big challenge here was how we can make uh, the different uh, modes connect to each other. We had from pedestrians, car and taxi, regional buses and trams, and then to all the way to trains. And all this was a challenge that needed to be dealt in different layers throughout the building. And a big important part in mobility is to be able to orient yourself. And for us, this um, weird form became the icon and the heart of how mobility can be organized through a single element. It was uh, conceived digitally and then all the way to its fabrication. In the end, it was fabricated out of steel, although originally imagined to be done in concrete. But um, this was possible due to the crisis of the shipping industry at the moment, and there was no availability in the concrete manufacturing because they were coming too expensive to what we did, and this allowed us to fabricate and then install on site. But the big important challenge um, at added value was the, the iconicity that this has and the simple way through the twist that organized all the different levels from below entering from the bus region, behind us being the parking, on the left you have the train station, halfway up you are on your pedestrian um, ramp connecting to the city and further behind us um, is the parking. So a simple gesture allowing a mobility hub to become iconic, something that you can always orient and repeat your visit when you repeat your visit. And 
This then was the challenge that we were asked also to, um, to actually make in a network. We were given the challenge of the Doha metro stations, and they said, okay, how can this identity of a singular element apply throughout a whole area, which a lot of the areas at the time were just desert. This was a big challenge for Doha um, in order to be ready on time for the World Cup that took place a few months ago. And they wanted to be able to provide a sustainable and efficient way of moving that then slowly it becomes part of their identity and their car-driven culture slowly adapts public transport. But the challenge here was a bit different uh, beyond the architecture itself. We were not, in a way, the architect who actually built it, but what we were requested is to actually guide all the rest of the architects who will build it. So we eventually made a branding manual, these three tomes uh, of about 2,000 pages, where we explained literally as in like a manual, like instructions, how you make your IKEA bed, how to make a network which doesn't only comply with functional needs, but it also brings the quality of the iconicity that we saw in Arnhem. This, yeah, here we see a little bit, a few more pages through this um, manual, and then here we see the different layers we, where we needed to kind of react to, from the level of the network, from um, the different lines that they were connecting uh, to each other, to every station. So also the um, colors that are, are slightly here used, we can see how like the network identity, the line identity, the station identity were infused within different typologies of uh, stations at the same time. We had the, the, this was at the time called a pop-up, but this is like the entrance to go to a subterranean uh, station. Uh, and then we had also upgrade stations and also above grade. So we created um, geometrical kind of uh, guidelines how this would be possible to take the geometry which was purely informed from function but also in bringing in historic heritage, cultural heritage that they wanted to incorporate and make it into a recipe what without knowing how wide the platforms are, how long they are, another architect could follow, let's say, by adding the values to the given field, get the correct result. And it worked. These are different stations in different locations where everything uh, came together. And uh, throughout a, a, a manual, creating identity and creating functional identity uh, for the metro stations, and um, it, it was able to be constructed from uh, different con contractor companies, uh, different architects, and have the result and the quality that was uh, promised from us. And again, mobility and thinking forward. Here is, is another level of speculating and looking uh, how future of mobility could work. And this is the collaboration that we have with uh, Hart Company, uh, which is um, the European branch of Hyperloop. How we can create uh, a new network within Europe, which uh, aims to be faster, uh, faster than the airplane and definitely more uh, sustainable. Again, the challenges were the same. We have a network, we have an iconicity, but this time we even have a bigger scale where we would need to think as uh, reacting to, not just one city. And again, uh, the ingredients uh, going back to modularity that we learned and how this can be uh, as a thought process, not as a finished product, but how we can make a scalable um, uh, solution that could adapt to a local city center or the edge of the city where maybe more commercial is needed or a, a new hub. And, and, and then test it in different uh, specific uh, locations and how they kind of, in the end, come together and allow for the speculation of mobility uh, with all the advantages uh, that it could bring 
to become part, an integral part of the city. So it's something that would connect across Europe. I think the route needs to go a little bit further south to come by also Katowice, but it, it, it is another level of speculating and learning from, uh, from, uh, from our experience in the past. I think we can have a small break. Dziękujemy za wszystkie pytania. W przerwie wykładu nasz mistrz wybrał najciekawsze z nich, więc niektórzy z Was zostaną nagrodzeni albo książkami autorstwa UN Studio, albo naszymi książkami o historii cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury. To jest książka, dla tych, którzy nie wiedzą, to jest książka, w której prezentujemy wszystkich 70 mistrzów architektury, którzy odwiedzili Katowice w ciągu ostatnich prawie 20 lat. Znajdziecie tam też wywiady z niektórymi z tych architektów, plus oczywiście zdjęcia ich realizacji, reportaże z ich pobytu w Katowicach. Jest sporo tekstów napisanych przez osoby pracujące przy cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury, chociażby Wojciech Małecki, Tomasz Studniarek i i wielu innych. Także e, jeśli komuś z Was się nie uda tej książki wygrać, to jest też możliwość zakupienia jej przed wejściem tutaj do sali wykładowej, również po wykładzie. Także zachęcamy. Uh, and now it's time for the second part of our lecture. So, Konstantinos, uh, the scene is yours. Before starting, I mean, I can also say that also this project uh, we're doing together with Tum Tobel, they're providing the light fixtures. Uh, it was not uh, on the screen, but uh, it's underway, that's why. Um, I will go through a few projects just to address the idea of uh, what is really green and how we kind of understand green uh, beyond just having green on a building, because there is a depth in in what kind of sustainability really is about. Um, it's about health. It's a, a, a challenge that uh, we kind of addressed in the campus that was recently completed in Amsterdam for booking. Um, the travel agency that um, you might uh, well know, which is actually based in, um, in Amsterdam, it's a Dutch company. And uh, we had the opportunity to design their, let's say, building, but it was literally for us a campus. It belongs into the long master plan next to the central train station. It was like, let's say, the corner piece that has a very prominent position replacing the old postal building. It's organized in a specific layers. It had like part of the master plan it had to fulfill a social side and a very closed uh, side from the trains, train tracks. One side you have to address a, a heavy load of noise. On the other one you have to fi find a permeable way and create this in-between atrium where you want to bring public in, but also create a privacy for the second atrium, but also connectivity at the same, a visual connectivity at the same time on how this creates the new way of working on the campus. This is just a little bit of a simple explanation of what the building is about. But for us, it was very important to understand the health and the well-being of the employees. And uh, as it's shown here, there is a, a vicious circle where how the company, the building, and the people are interrelated into new working environments. We've now experienced from working uh, from home, there are new uh, habits that are coming up and becoming more prominent in, in a work uh, environment and especially like in a technological company like the one of Booking where it wants to attract talent from all over the world. It's a very important thing on all these new companies to make them as sustainable in all levels. Sustainable in terms of this well-being, the mental well-being of the people, the sustainable in terms of building itself that it performs and fulfills our aspiration for a, a better world but also uh, give, getting, receiving back from that efficiency also within their company. So we envisioned this kind of big, let's say, atrium organizing the, the campus together. From the beginning of the project, which was uh, quite a few years back, we talked about um, having um, activity-based working and having connectivity and, con and movement 
uh, in, the, um, in the working environment. That was something that slowly got incorporated and towards the end it got amplified uh, in being accepted from the client. So we were able to materialize all these connections, connecting different um, branches of the department, but at the same time introducing also uh, communal spaces where they would meet and they would uh, kind of allow for this crossbreeding and sharing ideas. Uh, again, the, the idea of the network. And this allowed to have a very healthy, very well lit and where uh, kind of ventilated space, which although it's a very big space for a few thousand around, I think in the end there will be 5,000 uh, um, employees in the space, um, they, they still feel uh, in a natural environment. Ah, there we go. Uh, and, and again, we see this interconnectivity. Now it's not yet uh, finished the fit out, the opening of the handover, what happened before Christmas, but now in the coming months, they also uh, have made the interior part, which is also, again, a master plan of different uh, locations, which motivates you to move from one location to the other. This path is actually very interesting. You can also find it back into the outside, not only into the inside. So someone can also move and, 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 and follow the path, uh, weaving inside and outside, and also utilizing the, um, the, the, the roof deck. So the, an important part of sustainability is also taking care of us because all of this can be possible within a BREEAM excellent envelope, which is something that is the least expected f from, from our side today as architects, uh, and, but always keeping this, the human in the center of why a building needs to be so sustainable. Uh, again, I, was, I made a reference to this project, again, uh, recently completed be before six months. It's a cultural node in uh, the Delft uh, campus. It's a very traditional campus of buildings that are uh, associated with one department. What the Delft uh, um, hub did it was to connect and bring them together. And again, utilizing the, con the contemporary uh, technology to become sustainable and achieving the net zero uh, result. Um, traditional photovoltaics, large spans giving flexibility because also sustainability has to do with program and adapting and giving it uh, more longevity. The same way of construction, instead of building it on site, you can just assemble it, it's more cost-efficient and also saves in a CO2 in a significant way. And in order to use the least material, you're able to employ digital technologies to parametricize and make everything in a modular and prefabricated way. This is, again, something that is not the goal, but it's the means to, to make architecture. And this is uh, actually um, done also in the energy system of the building, where ap apart from the big glazed surfaces, employing also a shading outside, this will happen, a filtering through the air, but also using very slow movement air, allowing uh, for cooling and heating through the floor, which is uh, in lower temperatures and more efficient, and also using the um, ground for cold and, and, and warm storage. And all these, again, is for the user, it's for us. It's order to make a social, a very vibrant space that the students have already adopted and um, are using uh, very much. Again, multifunctional and flexible, where we can see here from a big auditorium on a different typology, uh, different areas where people can study or where they can, uh, um, let's say, communicate with each other. And all this promoting movement, promoting movement because it makes us more healthy and uh, more happy in being in that space. And that's the essence of uh, sustainability. Uh, to be in an environment that is very welcoming, that you want to go back and you feel pleasant. The way that is done, it's our responsibility to be always achieving the best uh, result, as in 
our example here, which is a net zero building. In a similar way, also in the project in um, Munich, uh, Van B, we were trying to rethink the program. It's uh, a city that is challenged for, from very limited, uh, let's say, residential product and very high prices. And how can we reuse the stock? This was an existing building which was partially reused uh, when it was rebuilt. And again, modularity on the facade which allows more efficient uh, construction uh, along the process. But the biggest, um, let's say, uh, innovation on this was to rethink a small apartment. And of course, it's something that it's not the first time. We see it very often in smaller um, but more personal units where we have uh, elements, these three, that are um, movable along these rails. This is uh, the showroom. Uh, these elements would allow to move. And um, as I said, this is okay, uh, uh, something that someone would do in their own apartment in a custom way. But the big um, success in this is that this was being, became a scalable product. In collaboration with Vitra, we made uh, a series of elements that they could be pre-ordered and installed in the apartment depending on the client's need either having a sleeping area, a working area, uh, a living area, or even a workout area. And of course, eventually, this could become a product that evolves in other, um, in, in, in other locations. And the efficiency, just uh, lastly, is like a 40 square meter apartment gains an efficiency of about 60 square meter apartments through the flexibility of um, moving these elements and reprogramming your space. And again, one more way of rethinking sustainability is actually being conscious of what is existing already there and the value of that that is already there, that is not ready to be thrown away. This is a project in Korea. Someone would say it's one more Asian project with a very futuristic facade, parametric, very interesting. But actually, this is how the project, uh, the building looked like a few years before and how it eventually was transformed. Uh, it was an, a very old building from the company who owned it, Hanwa, the headquarters, uh, with very dark tinted glass, single uh, layer glazing, very little um, uh, glass ratio in relation to the floor plate, a very dark and difficult for the contemporary market to work and be productive. We were able to regenerate uh, the building and the facade, also the interior, but here the challenging part was the facade, where we introduced higher floor to um, ceiling, let's say, glass ratio, introduce photovoltaics on the right uh, orientation, so it's also energy performative. Uh, small side note, the company actually uh, is in the business of photovoltaics, so it was also an important thing for them. And at the same time, the glass is clear, creating a better daylight condition. And all this happened while they were still working in it. We see this uh, band in the middle, that's four floors which are not occupied, but what's happening below and what's happening above is still functional and working um, office spaces of the headquarters. So it actually upgraded the building stock while not losing productivity of the company and uh, happening in a, in a very successful and seamless way. And this was, of course, through the help of our design tools where we organized and parametricized our elements in order to create uh, the, the, the result that they, they needed. I will uh, close the lecture. The second part is a little bit shorter. I'll close the lecture with this project, which as a first view, it, it falls a little bit out of place what I was sharing with you. But the big, big uh, thing here, that this is a research and innovation project. It's not just you in studio, but it's 29 participants out of 12 countries from research entities, from universities, from actually production companies, rethinking building, starting from the beginning all the way to the end. How can we become more circular, more, which essentially will become more sustainable? How can we rethink the whole process? And in particular, in this example, this is 
in relation to wood, but this is the way also we operate in the office where we try to find opportunities to rethink, a moment to pause and investigate and explore that allow us, like what we saw also in the first part, where there's always a projection from one project to the next to the next, how is there's an evolution? And in this project, it's not so much we can go through the detail, but starting already from the forest being harvested already to being built, but not only, but uh, going back and returning the project from where it came from. So we designed a modular system that we heard, but in this time, the very interesting part of the modularity is that it is based, everything is based on bio-based materials, from the profiles of the windows, uh, all the way to the insulation and the different panels that are built to have a, a certain, let's say, rigidity and also uh, thermal performance uh, in the system, and even on the way they're interlocking, because allowing a dry construction allows you to dismantle it and explore how you can return what you, um, what you took away back. And there are different strings for different products, either to go back to reuse or to the least uh, needed is energy recovery. And here we went through and exploring different materials, how they can be kind of taken away from the building. This building, there's a, there are two, one in the north in Finland and one in Spain. And these will be um, then uh, materialized and being a living example of how this could work. So in a way, sustainability is not just having green on a facade, but it's really having, having the future in mind and how we can create all these kind of resilient designs and adaptive with always having a human-centric approach and thinking of the quality that we live in, because I think that's the, the most, we think that this is the most important uh, part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Konstantinos. Uh, before we will read you the questions, uh, we would like to announce the results of the Zumtobel competition as well. I'm wondering, what is your statement about new materials from recycling in architecture? Do you think it's a future in architecture or just a trend for biomaterials? What is the UN Studios approach to global warming problem in case of design new buildings? I think the last project that we just saw would cover your question because, I mean, of course, you need to be kind of uh, curious and try out and find ways. Of course, we're very far from building actual buildings from that. There are big challenges uh, in that, but for sure, uh, bio-based is uh, the most circular way we can go forward with. And um, that's why we always keep open our interest and our investigation in bringing these new technologies. And whenever they start becoming more mainstream, you can also incorporate them in the actual building uh, progress and process. Thank you. Thank you. Gratulujemy. Jeszcze dodatkowo. Nagrody naszych partnerów od firmy Sto i firmy Fakro. Także gratulujemy jeszcze raz. Jeżeli będziesz chciała też podpis, to po wykładzie myślę, że możesz też podejść do naszego gościa po dedykację na, na, na książce. Ok, after the lecture, can you give a dedication, a signature on the book? We ask you to give signature on the book after the lecture. I ok, I it, didn't it's write fine. The book. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I would invite also Jerzy here with a microphone to help me answer the, the rest of the questions. Okay. So the next person, Wojciech Smyczek. We we invite you. Congratulations. How does? UN Studio approach cultural context and local identity when designing buildings and public spaces in different parts of the world. What specific strategies do they use to incorporate local cultural elements into their design while still maintaining their unique architectural style? Starting from the last word, I don't think we really believe in a style. We really believe on the context and the knowledge that we acquire. We had the example of this kind of cognitive reading 
this is a bit more the extreme, let's say, where you go and you really adapt and react to the spaces. But uh, we always uh, he listen to the clients who are there and visit the space in order to kind of bring the best uh, mixture of kind of performative and also kind of more human-centric results. So it's not that there is a style that we want to adapt in a, a location, like the example that we see here of the um, metro. There is a very strong cultural heritage, but then there are other buildings that just have an inspiration which becomes more abstract. So it's not a recipe to say, okay, uh, we want to adapt our style there. And, um, Congratulations. Some uh, reading for you. <laughs> More things to carry. Jeszcze nagrody oczywiście od firmy Sto i od firmy Fakro. So the next uh, yes, winners you. will win the Masters of Architecture book. Your project show a very individual approach, where each project contains unique elements and shapes. Does this method of work require the development of different scripts for designing shapes, facades, simulation each time? Does UN Studio employ people who are specifically responsible for developing work scripts for each project, like programmers and not architects? Okay, um, um, I, I will maybe start like this. I was uh, before working in a few uh, very famous offices doing like uh, shapes, futuristic shapes, and then I got the call from UN Studio to join the team. And the first thing, thing that strikes you immediately that you feel, again, like on a university, everyone is trying something new. You have this energy, this power, and um, like Ben van Berkel is teaching on the most famous universities and a lot of the partners are still teaching on universities. So imagine a feeling that you are working with your favorite professors and everyone in the team is a talent. You, you talk with someone um, from your team about a very uh, simple stuff and then uh, um, you realize that tomorrow he's not on, uh, in the office because he's making his PhD at um, MIT or something like this. So I really like amazing people we, I have the privilege to work with. And they are very different. Everyone is a different character. Everyone can do something different. And a lot of them can do with scripts uh, like Marvels. So obviously, yes. And there are also people that uh, have a little bit more um, IT background, a little bit more architecture. So as you see, the name of UN Studio is like it's a united network. So it's not everyone is the same. Everyone is totally different. And what makes the office is the power, the integration between all those forces working together to make an incredibly project. Is that a good answer? Gratulujemy. To najpierw nagrody od naszych partnerów, to i Fakro. And this for you as well. Thank you for the Thank question. You, and the last question. No, the, the, no, the last. We have, the, is this the last one? Yes, okay. we have four. Do you think that people who are not architects understand the main idea that stands behind your project without an explanation? If yes, how do you achieve this effect? The thing is, uh, what I would, I mean, what we showed in some of the project is beyond the main idea. It's how you feel and how you experience the space. And the biggest thing is the, the, the need to go back. So when we see projects and the way that they have, I mean, also in the contemporary culture, through hashtagging and how they become very popular, that means that there's something there resonating and connecting to the, the, the visitors, either their users or just tourists. So um, there is no real recipe, but there's always uh, an attempt to have something unique and try to connect with the space that we also talked earlier, but at the same time um, function as it needs. And we saw the example of the Erasmus Bridge and uh, also the Arnhem train station. They have uh, always a big detail that kind of connects and makes people come back. And eventually, this is uh, uh, what will happen in the Frankfurt 4 project that I'm uh, busy with. 
there will be a moment in the middle that we, you can take a photo and you will see all four high-rises um, above you. Thank you. Great, welcome. thank you very much. Yes, partnerów. Także gratulujemy. Czy jest jeszcze na sali ktoś, kto nie zadał pytania przez Instagrama, ale chciałby zadać pytanie teraz? Is there anyone who has any other questions? Someone brave? <laughs> really, I can't believe that you have no other questions to our guest. <laughs> Okay, so if we don't have any more questions to our Master of Architecture, uh, I think that we would like to thank you very much. Sonia? <laughs> so we, we, we have a gift for you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you for an amazing lecture. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the amazing lecture. Thank you to all of you for coming today. After the lecture, you can still visit the stands of our partners uh, together with the uh, Zumtobel stand uh, with um, a lot of uh, lights. And we also encourage you to buy the Masters of Architecture book, uh, which is also accessible on the stand, which is in front of the entrance. So thank you very much to you. Uh, thank you very much, Konstantinos. And, Thank you uh, as well for the invitation. Enjoy the rest of your stay in Poland. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jurek. <laughs>